Let's pray. Lord, we are about to come and look at your word. I mean, it's, your, it's another one of your gifts to us. And uh, it is precious. And it is, it is liberating. It's challenging. It is an expression of your love and it's a call to what we are meant to be. So as we look at your word, may, may we allow it to shape us. May we have our minds open to what it is you are saying and may we have hearts that are willing to receive your instructions so that we can take that next step in our journey of faith and draw closer to you. I thank you that we have the, have the Bible, that you have brought it together so now that throughout the world people can discover who you are, your character, your nature. And I thank you for those who have gone before who have been faithful in sharing that good news. I do praise you for it. Amen. Uh, one of the questions that I've been sort of mulling over, grappling amongst you know, other things of, you know, of, of daily life is really is wondering what the church is going to look like in 2023 and beyond. Uh, one of the things that COVID has done is really has rattled the church um, and made it us to ask some of the tough questions about, you know, well, what, what constitutes church, you know? What does it mean to be a fellowship coming together? Um, you know, does you know is is the the sort of the traditional model that we've had is that still going to operate in in our environment and our culture, uh, or do other models uh, maybe you know that we need to be looking at? And you you get you know you've heard of messy church, you know, which is uh, one been one model that's explored. Simple church is a an expression that I see is coming through a lot more now, um, which in some ways is like home churches and, and so forth. So there's different models. But also just thinking about the fact is that, you know, for those who are online today, you know, there's a massive community and mission field uh, on social media in that, that area and churches. Uh, how do you plan a church uh, on Twitch? You know, or how do you, you know, you know, how do you do, you know, do church uh, through something like Zoom and so forth? And those questions, uh, because you know, the environment has slightly changed. Uh, of course, one of the interesting things about it is uh, all of those are, are based around the idea, and it's I think a need that we have as human beings is being able to gather together with like-minded people. To worship an awesome God, and uh, and and in trying to do that, talking to a colleague who who is, uh, who does a lot of online stuff, and uh, he was trying to encourage someone to go to church. You know, oh, you should go and join your, you know, join a local church. Until the person he was talking to said, "Well, actually, in my country, there are no churches, and it's illegal." Um, and he, he went, "Ah, I need to rethink." what it means to be a church community in that situation. So just trying to grapple with those questions. Um, also, you know, our mission field of, in this country has changed. Uh, you know, when I started in ministry, which is now a long, I'm, I'm sort of getting a bit scary, you know, looking, looking back and going, well, that's, I've, I've, I've been doing this a little while. Um, it, it was a lot freer. Uh, there wasn't as much legislation. Um, and just like a lot of professions, a lot of legislation and stuff has come on. Um, you know, have a chat to a teacher about how much you know extra paperwork they have to fill out nowadays. It's save as back in the early nineties. Uh, it's it's a crazy world that we live. We seem to be wanting to be recording everything. Um, it, you know, um, got to put it down. That's the world we're in, and our mission field and and how to 
you know, the freedoms that we were able to have in this country, they're starting to disappear. Um, and also our culture is no longer as receptive. Uh, I think in, what was it, I was looking at the stats, 90, in the 1960s, like, you know, when I, was, when I was born, most people went to church. Most people identify, well, actually, I should rephrase that. Most people didn't go to church. Most people identified themselves uh, with a Christian um, uh, faith. Uh, that has changed, but still, you know, half the people in this country uh, identify a Christian uh, faith, a Christian heritage, a Christian you know, influence in their lives. Uh, of course, we all know that the growing, the biggest growing area is no religious affiliation. And, you know. So just trying to grapple with those things. Uh, of course, well, where do you go for sort of advice? I mean, I could go to Google, you know, which is usually a you know first port of call for most responses. Oh, I still remember the uh, the CEO of Yahoo when asked a question. He said, "Oh, I'll have to Google that," and I think that was a sort of like mm, that's an indication that maybe your company is not doing too well. Um, we could go there. There's a lot of good literature around, or we could also just go to look at the Bible, because one of the common statements is, "Oh." We need to get back to the early church. And I, I must admit, I chuckled. I said, really? You, know, you, you, you want to get back to the early church? Uh, back when, well, you know, that's kind of like what a, a number of our brothers and sisters are experiencing at the moment in countries where they're persecuted and you know, in jail and killed for their faith and stuff. So you, you want to go back to there? I mean, I personally... No, I, would, I, I don't really want to go back there. But going back and looking at some of those early principles, I think is a great, a great idea and a great reminder. But there is a danger of trying to take what happened back then and applying it in our culture, in our climate. And I want to show that just, just now. Uh, we're, we're looking at Matthew 10, of course. Um, and it's, it begins by saying that, you know, Jesus... Uh, called uh, his 12 disciples together, the, those that were pretty close to him. Oh, I should do this. I should go back. I wanted to do this. Okay, can you name the 12? Can you name him? You've seen it. Can you name them? Oh, you can sing it. Oh, that's, that's so tempting to have that there. But no, I, I won't get you to, to actually name them out, but... Can you actually just mentally go through your head right now and name all 12 disciples? Not their original names. Well, not all the time, but yeah, yeah, yeah okay. We'll, we'll go with an obvious one, Simon Peter. Yeah. Okay. Just, just do the finger counting. We've got, we've got, we've got, someone's got, giving you a hint already. I'm just curious as to whether, yeah. So, who can remember all twelve? I'm re I'm doing this for a point. I'm doing this for an interesting point. It's not just trivia. Yeah, I mean, I've I've actually I'm, I thought I'm going to try this on myself, and I sat there for ages having to go through, and I've been preparing this message. So here are the twelve. Yeah, you know, by the way, you've got sight. Now, did you spot the ones that you might have missed out? And also, as you say, some of them have got slightly different names. You've got Simon, who was going to be called Peter, and you've got Andrew, his brother. You've got James and John, their brothers, the sons of Zebedee. Philip, Bartholomew. Thomas, who's uh, actually John says was nicknamed the twin. You've got Matthew, the tax collector, the author of this particular book. You've got James, son of Alphaeus, the, uh, or actually, I think it's which is it John's Gospel called uh, the Lesser or the Younger. James, the Lesser or the Younger. In other words, you're not up there in the same league as James up here. Um, you've got Thaddeus, who's also called in Luke Judas, the son of James. It's it a little bit confusing. Simon the, Ze the Zealot, as opposed to Simon the Peter. And you've got Judas Iscariot who later betrayed him. I mean, that's just a little nice, a little bit of undercurrent there, just in case you, you forgot 
when Matthew wrote this gospel, who betrayed Jesus. So Jesus summons these 12 and he gives them, you know, he gave them the authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Uh, and, and he's going to send them out. So you can imagine how right at this moment, oh, yes, we've been given authority to cast out evil spirits and to, and to heal. You know, I think they'd be quite pumped. You know, there'd be, be a lot of, yeah, backslapping. As, as he talks about what he's give, giving them to do. Uh, probably a bit of nervousness because, you know, he's, gonna, he's probably explaining, he's going to send you guys out. Uh, I'm not going to be with you. Oh, that's a bit, you know, you know, scary. But I've given you this authority. By the way, that's most of the same things that I've already been doing. Uh, you know, this is what you know, I'm going to give to you as you go out. What is interesting for me about those is that a good number of them kind of disappear off the radar. Okay, so this is this is the as, as we're going. Oh, I can remember ten, and they're they're our church fathers. You know, they're, they're the, these are the apostles that we're talking about here. And yet we're going. Oh, who was it? You know, like like Thaddeus, Judas, the son of James. This is where he's only mentioned. You know, in these beginning lists of this particular type of event, he sort of you don't hear much about him at more. He doesn't pop up. Uh, of course, we know about Simon and we know about Andrew, James and John. Yep, uh, you know, we get up there and know about them. Uh, what is it? James is uh, James is one of the first uh, uh, apostles to actually uh, die. Well, actually, that's not technically correct because Judas beat him to the punch. But James was executed, uh, so the first of the apostles to die. Um, but the others, we know Philip get up there and he met an um, a Ethiopian and so uh, we know what happened to him. But Bartholomew, have you ever done a Bible study on the life of Bartholomew? We know Matthew, he wrote a book. And James, the son of you know, Alph oh, Alpheus, I'm just going to call him James the Younger, it's much easier. Done a study on him? Simon the Zealot, maybe? It's probably more likely you would have done a study on Judas Iscariot. I'm just pointing out that these are the 12 apostles, and yet history in the world didn't really bother to record much information about a number of them. And yet they were instrumental in planting and forming the early church. You can go and, um, you know, outside of the Bible, you can find out a bit of information, but there's a whole lot of conjecture about what happened to, to some, you know. Some, you know, like I think Thomas is supposed to die in India, but then again, he's supposed to die somewhere else. Uh, both accounts, by the way, was he was stabbed with a spear. Um, you know, uh, Matthew... Actually, Matthew's got a whole range of different uh, rumours about him. He either died of old age, he was executed, boiled, or you know, flailed. Um, one of those options, you know. Uh, so we don't really know a lot about him. But these people, they were the core foundation of the early church. Sometimes I think we, when we look at the apostles, we go, we. Just think about Simon and also we chuck Paul in there as well and stuff and think about these super guys, amazing impacts and everything, but the reality is we only know a few of them because they're recorded in Scripture for us. Most of them calmly and quietly went about doing what they were called to do by God. And in this case, they've been sent out and, you know, and, and off they go. Then Jesus gives them this list of instructions, um, which, you know, if you were doing a campaign... Um, if you're doing something like Australia for Jesus or something, I'm not sure you'd give these same instructions. But there are some good lessons in here to learn. Uh, Matthew tells us that they were told to focus on a particular group. You know, so Jesus says to him, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. 
It's not that Jesus is not concerned about the Gentiles and Samaritans, but he's saying to these guys, you have a particular group, particular focus group that I want you to go to and to meet. And it's such an important thing to recognise, who is it that I'm actually going to try to, to meet with? We're told, like, even if you're walking down the road and you see someone and you're starting a conversation with them, don't stop there, go to the town. That is what you've got to do. You've got this particular group that you're going to focus. And, of course, the group that he's chosen is some, the group that these guys are going to be very familiar with. There's no cultural uh, barriers here. They're not doing a cross-cultural ministry or anything like that. They're going to go be meeting people who are just like them. And I think that was quite significant you know, for Jesus in doing that. This intentionality, you know, real big word, um, you know, of focusing and working out who am I going to reach uh, and go and focus on and share the gospel with. Because the reality is I could share it with everyone. But here, Jesus is very specific. You, you know, you're going to this group. And he's going to say to them how you will relate to that particular group. And that's, I think that's something helpful for us. Who do we focus on? Are we intentional about who we are trying to reach uh, for the gospel? Uh, or do we do the sort of the, the, uh, the blunderbuss sort of thing and just fire it off and hopefully it'll hit something? And, um, or maybe we don't pull the trigger at all. I don't know. But here Jesus says be focused. Focus on a particular group and in this case, a group that you are very comfortable with. And then he told them to announce the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, this is the same message that John the Baptist and Jesus has been saying, that God's kingly power is being exercised over creation and people. And this was in a culture that was under sort of this, uh, had this current running through of expectation of one day the Messiah is coming. Ooh, you know, um, Mind you, they've probably gone, well, he hasn't turned up yet. Is he ever going to get here? But they had this current of looking for a Messiah. And so to be able to say the kingdom of God is near is quite easy to actually be able to do in that culture. It was a culture that where life, every part of life, was affected by faith. Not like our culture. You know, we are very sort of Greek thinking. We sort of separate the two. The Hebrew culture is, you know, you couldn't take, you know, you couldn't take faith out of anything. I still laugh at, at college. We're told about the prayer for being able to be regular on, on the toilet. You know, and our lecturer said, if, don't laugh because if you're not, you you will be praying a lot more. Um, but it was that was that was the, the reminder that for them. Every aspect of life involved faith. And so being able to talk about that was, was a lot easier. Our culture is actually the opposite. So this is probably not the greatest advice uh, for us in our culture. This, like I said, despite the fact that over 50% of the population identify themselves as Christian, it is awkward to have faith conversations, especially with those that we know. Sometimes it's a lot easier to talk to a stranger than to talk with those that we know about faith uh, because it gets awkward very quick. The classic, don't preach to me, often pops up quickly. Or, or the, oh, you know, the roll of the eyes, here we go again, type thing, you know, that stuff. Um, it is difficult. So that so we have to work a lot harder now in our with our conversations, you know, to be able to just go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. We actually need to actually now in our culture to start engaging them in what is it you believe. Why do you believe that? You know, and look for those links where we can then say, well, you know what, the kingdom of heaven has an answer for that. Well, this is what. Jesus would say.
Today I wonder if, if he wouldn't send us out to now and say, go out and ask them, what do, they, what do you believe? Why do you believe that? And look for the opportunities then maybe to announce the kingdom of God is near. They were given the authority to uh, heal the sick, raise the... Oh, this is what they were told to do, by the way. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Oh. Could you imagine that? Imagine how viral a video would go if you were doing that. You know, going down to Huskinson and you get up there and, uh, you know, there's a car accident. You go, Don't worry, I've got this. Lord, and please heal this person. Yay! That, that person's dead. Don't worry, got this. That would be so much more exciting than say, would you like to talk about Jesus? I think. Because that, you know, you, you, is where we're doing something. We don't have to say something. Uh, I'm not sure about casting out demons. That part is make me, would make me a bit nervous, you know, to be perfectly honest. But imagine having that as your duty statement. Go. You, know, you see a dead person, oh, just raise them off. You see someone really sick, just heal them. Wouldn't you love to be able to be sent out you know, and be told, go out and just heal people you meet. You might have a queue up at your door very quickly. That's what happened with Jesus, of course, when he did a healing. And people would focus on wanting to be healed and not about why the healing could take place. It's interesting, that's why he says, announce that kingdom first before you do this. But let's be face it, we don't have that today. Uh, it was, it was uh, not something that we seem to be given, though it's still happening. It still happens in places. The command that we've been given is, of course, is to go, <laughs> go and make disciples uh, of all nations and teach these new disciples to obey all that I, the commands I give you. Um, I think that, would, that is easier than going and making disciples. It says, give as freely as you receive, be generous as much as you receive. Don't be overly, crazily generous. Uh, so you put yourself in strife. This one, don't take your credit cards with you. I'm not sure many missionary organisations operate on this principle. But why was he doing that was because he's telling them, God's going to tr provide for you. You need to learn to trust God for what you need. Give us today our daily bread. So if you haven't got the money, you're not carrying a spare change of clothes or sandals or even or walking stick. So, you know, guess what? It could get pretty cold at night. Uh, if you haven't got that, you need to trust God will provide. And so if you're offered hospitality, don't hesitate to accept it. Because this is part of God's provision. So Jesus was preparing them to actually go and trust. And that's something that uh, I think we would find a bit tricky. Well, I, I mean personally. I would definitely take my phone with me and I'd phone a friend if necessary. But they were, what they were told, look, trust. Don't, don't go trying to solve it yourself. Go trusting God will provide the means for you to do what I'm about to ask you to do. I would love to hear the conversation at this moment because I'm sure some of them be going, what? You know, not even an emergency fund, you know, just sort of down the back of the road somewhere, in case. No, it says go and trust. And when someone offers you hospitality, 
receive it. Don't hesitate. Don't try to find something better. Just accept the hospitality. Don't look for the, uh, the better option, as it were, because often you'll miss the God one. And then he tells them, now whenever you get somewhere, wherever you enter the city or the village, you're to search for a worthy person and stay in his house until you leave the town. That worthy person, by the way, is not necessarily the, the, you know, the person who's the best in the town or the person who you know, is maybe the most generous in the town. It is someone who's receptive. Look for someone who's receptive, that worthy person of hearing the message and spend time with them. And here again, I think it's a great lesson for us. Who do we know and who are we praying for that is a person worthy of receiving the message? One of the challenges we, we uh, think we have is we've got someone we really want to come to Christ. And we put all our energy and effort and try, you know, and say, oh, Lord, please. And we get disheartened because they don't. It may well be that they're not worthy in the sense that they're not ready and not receptive and not going to be receptive at this stage to hearing about God. So need to find, and by the way, don't write them off. Don't write them off. Continue to pray for them. Continue for the opportunities. But we need to look for someone who's more receptive. The, this, could, this can actually happen in families very much if we've got a family member that we really want to come to Christ. And go, oh, you know, that we might actually be missing the fact that other family members are going to be more receptive as we tunnel in on that one. So Jesus is saying, be sensible about who are you going to share your time with? Because you've only got this long. I'm, this might sound a bit cruel, but if, you, if you've been trying to reach someone for years now, then I, I would suggest maybe you want to just give them to God and look for others. If you've got a good friend, don't drop the friendship. But instead of trying to invest so much time in sharing the gospel with them, take a step back and see who might be around them. That is worth spending time with as well because they'd be more receptive. Tough thing to do, especially if they're a family member or a good friend that you don't want to go to hell. But Jesus said, look for the worthy person, the receptive person, and spend time with them. And then he says, you know, when you enter the house, give them the blessing, you know, which was a traditional thing, of course, uh, hang around. Uh, one of the other interesting things is, by the way, if, if they reject that, then basically when you walk out of the city or the town, it, you do the, you know, kick the dust off your shoes, which is basically saying, I'm, I'm not having any more to do with you. It used to be a custom too that if you went somewhere where Gentiles were and you came back home, you'd make sure you kicked the dust off. Didn't want to get infected by those Gentiles as you came back into the house. But this idea of actually who's searched for a worthy person, I think that it, that's a really good challenge uh, for us. Because sometimes we can invest so much time and energy and effort in a person who is not receptive and it is not uh, is is not worthy that might sound a bit harsh but if we've only got so much time and someone is has, has been you know, going no 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 actually stepping back may be the best thing and say i love you i'm going to pray for you i st i'm still hoping and praying that one day the light will come on and you'll go Oh, I do need Jesus. But I'm actually going to be looking around to see who else I could possibly share the good news with. Then, actually, at this point, all good. 
you go and heal and cast out demons and, you know, and raise the dead and everything, all good. Go into a town, spend time with people. Yeah, this is sound like this is my type of ministry. Yep, that's fine. And then Jesus says, oh, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Oh, at this point, my nervous radar would probably be going off. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. One of those expressions that you occasionally hear said, uh, which is, by the way, in other words, don't be naive. And also remain innocent. Uh, be as harmless as doves. You know, be a person with, when it comes to dealing with evil, you know, be like a dove. You know, doves are cute and they go coo coo and they make all those lovely noises. But you know, you don't. You know, but don't be naive in what you're doing, because uh, be aware. This is where it starts to get a bit hairy. For you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You will tr uh, stand trial before the governors and the kings because of you are my followers. Uh, you are going to have a tough time. It is interesting. This is the 12. Whoops. It is interesting that this is the 12. You know, and they're going to have a tough time. You're saying you are going to have a tough time. And by the way, when you read an Acts, you go, Oh, yeah, this is what happened to a number of the guys. Sharing faith is tough. What is surprising is that Jesus goes, but if this happens, beauty, you've got an opportunity to tell the rulers and other believers about me. Uh, for those who were here when Voice of the Martyrs uh, came and you know, we saw, um, you know, we were watching that, you know, him praying in prison and the prison guard finally saying, who are you praying for? Well, I can pray for you. You know, faith, opportunities to share our faith, those tough times. And when you're arrested, don't worry about how to respond and what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time, for it is not you who, not you who will be speaking, it will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Which probably is, you know, when you think about it, a number of these guys were not particularly good orators. I mean, can you imagine the conversation with Peter, James, and Andrew and you know, John, some fishermen start talking? Yeah, it probably wouldn't be sort of in um, uh, sort of a, oh, we went fishing again. You know, it was jolly fun in the Hebrew equivalent. It was down to earth. It was earthy. I mean, these, all these guys were really earthy people. And so to come before a court, I don't know if you've ever had to experience that, come before court, I mean, it's nerve-wracking even when you're not there before, you know, because of some crime you've done, but just supporting someone. You go, he says, don't worry about that. You will be given the words to say, which for me is a great comfort. When you find a situation, I don't know what to say, that's when you say, I don't need to know what to say. I just need to trust God and say it. That still applies today, by the way. And, and we're moving into a culture where this is going to become, it appears to become more and more evident. I'm not sure if you heard about the news of Tasmania uh, bringing in a law, well, they've got a law, uh, a motion proposed up there where it will be illegal to actually talk about gender-related issues and conversion of gender-related, you know, uh, even potentially for parents to talk to their kids about that because you're trying to coerce them into making a particular decision. And you could be brought before the courts over that. And so what is Jesus' answer to that? It's an opportunity. Don't be afraid. You'll be given the words to say. And then Jesus, oh, hang on, no, I won't say that because that's actually the next 
part two of this series uh, of looking at chapter 10. I'm going to stop here. You can breathe a sigh of relief. I'm not going through the rest of it. I'm actually I'm going to pick up the second half uh, in a fortnight's time. Next week, uh, David will be here uh, giving the message uh, because Faye and I will be in Sydney for a family uh, uh, reunion get together uh, so thankfully David has stepped in and said he's happy to do that Jesus sent these people out with specific instructions of what to do and he was teaching them to trust God and not to worry about trying to come up with the right answers not to worry about that they'd planned it out perfectly. You know, he gave them, go to a place, look for someone worthy, spends time with them, and then move on. I suspect the apostles made a lot of good friends that, uh, on that trip. But they knew that they had to share the good news. We get to read, of course, they came back all excited and pumped because you know, they casted out demons and, you know, and, and they preached the word and they healed people. And they did all these things. But Jesus here is saying, I'm sending you people who are innocent, sheep, into a world that, is, that can chew you up. But those opportunities, make the most of them because they're opportunities to share. Our culture is not as harsh as what these guys had to face. But our culture has some unique challenges. And guess what? Jesus says to me and to you, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you out. I'm going to send you to people. I'm going to equip you. And don't worry about what to say. I've got it covered. Just trust me. We are here because people like us took this message and the message of the Great Commission seriously enough to go and do that. We would not be here if someone didn't actually go, this is so scary, but I am going to go and build a relationship with this person and hopefully talk to them about faith. And you might say, well, no, it's my, my parents. Yeah, but who talked to your parents? At some point, some stranger came and said Hi. And from there, God was at work. And you're here today because of it. We've got a culture that is increasingly moving away. And the answer that God says is us. As we build relationships with people, as we seek to share our lives with them. Can I say, what a great honour these guys must have felt when they all got sent out. I reckon they were probably, what's the right word, slightly nervous because they were flying solo now. Yet because of their faith, we're here. Hopefully future generations will be here, part of God's family because of the work we do. Though no one might know it. Just like some of the 12 apostles. Do you know the 12? Let's pray. Father, sometimes I think we, we get caught up in the fact that in your word, you've got Peter and you've got Paul and all these amazing things that they're doing and, and we go classically, we can't do that. But 
the other guys are there as well and we don't hear much about them, but they were still faithful. They were doing your work. Help us to be like that. To quietly go about doing what it is you're asking us to do. And Lord, they were intentional. They had to learn to trust. They had to learn to take the opportunities that were presented to them, even when things looked tough, and allow you to speak through them into those situations. But they are also a blessing to the households they came to. And may we be like them so that future generations, so family members, so that friends can come to know you as well. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Amen.